What is the science of reading? What are leaders doing to accelerate reading achievement? We answer these questions and more in Science of Reading Leadership, Guiding Minds, Transforming Lives, powered by Just Right Reader. All right, we have another fantastic episode of Science of Reading Leadership, and today we are thrilled to have Dr. John Hutton on the podcast. Dr. Hutton is a pediatrician in the Cincinnati Children's Hospital Division of General and Community Pediatrics and director of the Reading and Literacy Discovery Center, but we don't stop there. Dr. Hutton is also the Associate Professor of Pediatrics in the Division of General and Community Pediatrics at UT Southwestern and Dallas Children's Hospital. His research at Cincinnati Children's covers all facets of pediatric general and health literacy. He is applying MRI to better understand the influence of modifiable aspects of home reading and screen environments on structural and functional brain networks supporting emergent literacy, the skills and attitudes preparing a child for reading. His work was the first to document such effects prior to kindergarten, widely featured in national media. He's published 29 children's books, many with health promoting themes. Dr. Hutton, welcome. We're so excited to have you. Thank you, Christy. It's a pleasure to be here. And, and quite the I, bio. We're there. quite the bio and in such a different perspective than um, some of our other guests might bring. So we're really excited to have you. It's definitely a mouthful, at least. So, <laughs> um, yeah, no, I appreciate it. Well, I'm super excited that you're here and I can't wait to hear about your journey and just everything. So let's start there. What got you into this field of work and why are you so passionate about literacy? So uh, that's a great question. Thanks, Terry. I, when I was a kid, I mean, I, I would really, my favorite things to do were, were to, to play outside in the dirt. I played baseball. I, you know, um, but then when it was raining, I was fortunate to have parents who were both readers themselves. And, um, you know, they read to me and, and, you know, I remember Curious George and um, Richard Scary and Where the Wild Things Are and all these things. And, and um, you know, just growing up in a household like that, I think made me value reading. Um when I had my own kids and I have three of them, three daughters, um, 18 to 30, um, we started reading when they were infants. I mean, I couldn't breastfeed. I couldn't do a lot of things, but, um, but as a dad, I really took that as part of my job was to, which I loved was just to read with them every day. And I, I really did until they were really too old. You know, they kicked me out of the room the way we were around 12. Um, so in any case, so those experiences, both being read to and then reading my own kids, um, you know, just fueled that, that interest in the whole area when I was in training. Well, and then subsequently I, I started pediatric residency in Cincinnati and then actually took a hiatus when my second daughter was little and ended up running a children's bookstore for about uh, almost 20 years. Um, and yeah, it was called Blue Manatee Children's Bookstore. And I uh, was out of pediatrics for about seven years, just focusing on the bookstore, you know, getting into the whole world of children's literature. And then when I went back to pediatric training, that was my whole focus was I'm going to, um, you know, see what, what can a pediatrician do in the, in the area of primary care to, um, empower families to, you know, read the way that I was read with and, and how I read to my own kids, and then hopefully to make it an enjoyable and impactful experience. And also to address a lot of the disparities that I'd seen, you know, working in a children's bookstore, you see families that have tons of books at home and they read all the time. And then in clinic, I worked with a lot of families who had no books and, um, and those were some real, some real areas of um, concern. And a lot of the kids, you know, had struggled with reading as a result. So in any case, so that's what really fueled my batteries was just my own experiences. And then, and then just seeing the different, the different worlds of, of books and reading. I love to hear people who follow their passion, right? Who allow their life and their uh, journey to be unique and one that is led by what's happening and what's necessary. I think that's really how solutions come about. So I applaud you for that. So that's awesome. Yeah. What a, what a Thank neat you. and interesting journey. Tell us, tell us a little bit more um, about some of your research and what you're learning from the NMRI scans that you're doing about the brain and literacy. Sure. Um, and, and that was another area that was really unexpected. When I, when I finished my pediatric residency, I was recruited to come back as a fellow um, in what, what had just started as the Reading and Literacy Discovery Center, which is a small but mighty center focused on the science of reading. And then also um, the clinical side looks at um, kids are referred in with reading difficulties and making diagnoses and, and getting them on the right track to therapy. But 
But my mentor as a fellow was an MRI researcher who had, who had done a lot of work in language development. And um, really, I, I never expected to get into that area. And he said, no, it's, it's, you know, this is a new way to look at the, at the issue. And, um, you know, you can really make your mark that way. And, and one of the first things I did as a fellow is I went into the American, the American Academy of Pediatrics had just released their, their first ever guidelines related to reading and literacy promotion and primary care. That was about 2014. And I, I read them and there was a lot of reference to the brain and reading is good for the brain, which we know it is. But I was looking for the studies that involved any kind of brain imaging and MRI so to figure out how to direct my work. And there really hadn't been any studies at that time that used MRI as a tool. So we conducted a series of studies in Cincinnati looking at preschool age kids, which is about as young as you can get to get them to cooperate and go into the scanner. Because <laughs> and, and, you don't sedate them. You don't, um, you know, you can't coerce them at all. They have to do it voluntarily. And it ends up being a, a big game. And if anyone's had an MRI, they know that's a kind of a, a tall order. It can be pretty noisy and claustrophobic. But in any case, so we, um, we conducted a series of, of studies. And the first one was uh, published in 2015. And it was... It, really went off like a, like a bomb. I mean, it was the first study to really, what, what I say is like using high tech methods to verify the obvious that reading promotes brain development and, and that there are differences in, um, this was functional MRI in how, how children's brains at that age, um, respond when they're hearing stories in the scanner, um, between kids that have a lot of experiences with books and reading at home and ones that, that had less. And so, um, so building on that, we, we now published about um, about 12 or so of them, you know, looking at that same question at that age. Um, and it's made it, it's made an impact. I mean, the, a lot of, there's been a ton of research um, that's been really well done going back decades in the educational fields. You know, we know that reading to kids in preschool age range and beyond is really good for them in terms of their skills and relationships. But this was just the, a unique way to look at it, just using the, the brain scans. Yeah, that's fascinating. So from that, you know, from all that you're seeing, what are some of the most important things that families can do to support that brain development in babies? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And I mean, we've done a, a number of different types of scans. Um, there's two main categories of scans in MRI research. There's structural scans, which is sort of the um, the wiring of the brain, which is called white matter. And then the the, the surface of the brain called the cortex and then, <clears throat> excuse me, and then there's functional MRI scans, which are more brain activity. And we've done both. Um, we found that um, we really started going through the questions, starting simply like, does having more books at home and reading more often make a difference? And it does. Um, but then the one that I think is probably most impactful that parents can really, you know, certainly having more books is important, but uh, reading more interactively. Um, we've done, we published a study looking at what's called the uh, dialogic reading, which is the, <clears throat> sorry, which is um, just um, making reading fun, you know, more than just reading the words on the page, but asking questions and talking about feelings and, and really going beyond the text to just make it more of an experience where the grown up and the child are, are spending that time together, exploring the story and then exploring how they feel about it. And that that's been shown to really make an impact on a part of the brain that's involved with talking and language and, and processing emotions. And, um, so, so making reading as fun and interactive as possible makes a big difference and, and drivers for that can be confidence and they can be training, but then they can also be just picking books that kids like, you know, um, the, um, the content, you know, making sure that you're, what you're reading with the child is something that they're excited about. How fun. I love that you've kind of talked about that dialogic reading and that it's not just about reading the book, but making sure that we're getting families just a little bit more engaged, a little bit more interactive as they as they have that bonding time together. Um, and I hear, too, Dr. Hutton, that you are an author. Tell us a little bit more about the books that you've written, why you wrote them. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, I, I kind of came about that the a similar way. My dad was a doctor, my mom was a writer, so I, I'm sort oh. of channeling a little both of them. <laughs> so they're um, do both. <laughs> yeah, I said, I mean, why not? But um, but in any case, um, yeah, I'm actually up to about 45 books, and they're all oh, wow. short. They're, well, and they're they're mostly these. So um, I don't know if you ever heard of board books, those little kind of square books, and that's most of what I've done. Those in picture books. Um, but I got into that initially when I was a pediatric resident where, where um, 
there was a big concern about screen time, you know, kids watching too much TV or videos and whatever it is. And um, I did, I published a series of books called Baby Unplugged that are sort of like, I, I, I basically asked the question, okay, so how can we address this issue with families and we can give them pamphlets, we can, we can talk to them all we want, but why not use an actual children's book that has messaging about, you know, other things to do that don't involve screens, like playing in the yard or playing with pets or blocks or whatever it is, and just show how joyful and wonderful those things are. And, and so that series is, is really just a, a, a series of different topics that are alternatives to screen time. And then we've also done some books related to health literacy, which are um, using the children's books as a way to convey health information to parents um, on topics such as safe sleep to, mm. pre to reduce the risk of SIDS, um, breastfeeding, um, calming a baby when they're crying in that colicky stage and interactive reading. There's a, a series of books called DR books that um, there's four of them. There's cats, dogs, bugs, and cows that um, are, are really simple, fun stories, but they actually through the story itself um, encourage what's called dialogic reading, which is asking more questions during the story and, and really going beyond the text to make it a more interactive experience. And we use those actually as training tools with families um, in some community-based programs that we've, that we've put together. Um, and then we also have a book that's recently we published that I'm excited about. It's called Share, Share This Book. That's actually an acronym that is um, how do you read with an infant, which can be a kind of a daunting proposition. It sort of frames expectations around what that looks like because it can be really messy, but it also is really important. So anyway. All right. Well, since you brought that up, let's talk a little bit more about that acronym, that SHARE. Can you just tell us a little bit more about that? Because... I mean, I have three daughters also, and I was like, I'm going to read with them. I'm going to read with them from the time they come out. And that first sure. one, she would roll around and walk all over the place. And I just, you know, I want to know about that sharing. Yeah, that, that's a, absolutely right. Um, kids are very, very different. I mean, some kids just take to um, take to books naturally and will sit still from a really young age. Some are, are more gross motor oriented or, or jumping off your lap and want to run around the room. And, and really the, the key with all of it is just to, just to keep it as, as fun and um, interactive as possible and, and just to meet the child where they are. And if you have to read to them while they're standing up, that's fine. If you read them in the, in the car or at dinner, or at bedtime, whatever, just find a routine that works for you at home and um, you know, just keep coming back. I mean, sometimes reading doesn't go well and the, the child cries and chews the book, throws it on the floor. They're not into it. That doesn't mean you're not a good reader. That doesn't mean reading's not, not great. And that they're not going to get something out of it. It just means that wasn't a good day for them. And you just want to keep trying to keep build up a routine that they're going to look back on and say, that was a really joyful, fun thing that was important. But share is actually an, an acronym that um, is, is supposed to mod, like just explain, really explain those principles to, to parents um, starting as early as possible. We've given the book out um, prenatally. We give it out for new babies in the nursery, but um, the S and, S and share stands for snuggle. H is let the baby hold the book if they can. Um, a is show affection, just make it cuddly and, and, a, and a loving experience. R is respond to the baby. So, so see what they do in response to what you read. And E is enjoy, you know, remember, Reading is not just something to get ready for a test. It's something that should be enjoyable because if they enjoy it, they're more likely to do it themselves later. And then the R in share stands for respond. And then there's another part of share that's called step. It's share dash step. Um, and step are ways to respond to a baby at that age. And, mm -hmm. and the S is, S stands for stretch words out, which is, it's been called mother ease or parent ease, you know, like um, dog, you know, and you kind of make those weird, you know, Sounds. And that helps babies, helps babies like understand the sounds in words and what words, what word sounds come together to make words. Um, the T is talk about pictures on the, on the page. Um, e is, um, is explore new word sounds. So things like choo-choo train noises or dogs barking. So just that silly aspect of reading with a baby. And then P is patience, which is probably the most important. Just remember, <laughs> doesn't always go well, just be patient. Yeah, I, <laughs> it's so funny that you say that, that patient part, because oftentimes I'd find myself being impatient. I'm a teacher, right? I want my kids to come out the womb being so studious. But um, with this last one, I have found that things that I thought she wasn't sitting still and listening to, she picks up. 
and she'll repeat yeah. them to me weeks later, days later. So she really is paying attention. She really is listening, even though she's rolling around all over the place. So patience really is important. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> And it, it, it's really important because especially for parents who don't have as as much experience with, with maybe it's their first child or, or not as much experience with reading or whatever it is, there's a real concern that unless you frame expectations around what does reading with an infant look like, um, you have pediatricians talking about read as soon as possible starting starting at birth. And and if, if the family tries it and the baby chews on the book and they think, well, my baby doesn't like books, they're just chewing on them and, and that's normal for them to do that. If they drop it on the floor, if they cry, that doesn't mean the the parent's not a good reader or the child doesn't like books. It's just, that's how it goes sometimes. And so it's really important just to take a deep breath, say this is a messy thing, but it's all part of building routines. Um, you know, children, when they start eating are pretty messy too. You know, it just takes time to kind of you know put your reps in. Yeah. Dr. Hutton, I'm interested too, particularly for families and, you know, school leaders and educators as well. Um, obviously, technology has become more and more ubiquitous, you know, apps and um, electronic online reading. Tell us a little bit more about the difference between digital books versus like hard copy print books. Is is there a difference, I guess, for one on what that does to the brain? Um, we'd love to hear more of your thoughts and research on that. That's a really important question too, um, and it's gotten more so as as sort of digital books have gotten more sophisticated, where they're more quote interactive, where they have different kind of bells and whist whistles attached to them, and you know even probably coming down the line with Siri and Alexa doing the reading and talking, and 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 it's just a whole really quickly shifting landscape. In general, um, like digital books versus versus regular books. Um, the, the more simple the digital book is, the more it's like a regular book. And like we know regular books are, are super healthy and great with kids because they really, one of the nice things about them is that is they're, they only do one thing. You, I mean, like you have to sit and read it, you know, and, and they don't have other, they don't have apps or email or anything in them. I mean, you sit down, you open it and turn the pages and read. Um, so they're wonderfully plain in that way. And, and the other piece is that they don't do anything unless you bring your own efforts to bring them to life. So they are great catalysts for that grown up child interaction where both the grown up and the child have to participate to make the story come to life. And whether it's you're asking questions or reading the story or, or, or touching the page or whatever. Digital books, um, one of the things, I mean, if it's if a digital book is just the pictures and and, and it's, it's used in, the, in a similar way where you have to turn the pages digitally and, and you're just looking at the book, it's probably, I mean, I, there are differences, but it's going to be more like a like a traditional book than than not, and those can be distracting. Like sometimes they can be, you know, I mean, like for an alphabet book, for example, if you touch the apple and, and you're on the A page, and that might help a child learn some some words that begin with letter A. But for stories where it's all about paying attention and and participating in the story, the more those things are going on, the more it can be distracting from the experience. And then when animation happens, that's when all bets are off because then, then, then it acts more like TV or a movie. And we've done some research using MRI actually looking at differences between audiobooks, uh, illustrated books, and, and animated books in the preschool age range. And there are big differences in how the brain networks interact during those kinds of stories. In a in an animated book, there's really, really made most of the, of the focus, horsepower in the brain is going into visual processing, just watching the pictures and the movement because it's going fast and the brain just only has so much capacity to process. And so there's hyper focus on the visual areas with less language and less imagination. With um, audiobooks, there's there's it's sort of the opposite. It's like there's more language, uh, but not as much visual, and it's harder to imagine what's going on at that age. Picture books in the middle, there's this nice balance between visual processing of the picture, bringing in some some imagery from the child's experience and use, and language. And um, it's probably why at that age, it's sort of the perfect balance because it, it, require, it encourages the child to do some work themselves in terms of using their imagination to bring in their, their own experiences into, the, into play. But it's, um, it's giving them a little bit of a visual anchor so they can understand the story better. This episode is brought to you by Just Right Reader. Extend phonics instruction, strengthen school home partnerships, and accelerate reading achievement with take home decodable packs from Just Right Reader. Personalized take home packs make phonics fun and accessible for families. Every book 
comes with a video phonics lesson and writing pages to help readers reinforce their decoding and writing skills. To learn more, visit JustWriteReader.com. So then in that terms, or as we start to think about, I kind of felt like you were saying the, you know, the Goldilocks effect. This is just That's right. right. Yeah. Okay. That's what we've called just. it in our papers. And I'm, I wanted to say that. So. It is, I love the Goldilocks it. I love effect. it. So this Goldilocks effect, if this is just right, then with that knowledge and all that we're being bombarded with in education, what should we as school leaders and school districts be thinking about in regards to um, how we approach li early literacy? How can we support them coming into kindergarten? Like, what should we be thinking about as educational leaders? Yeah, and I mean, I, I think in terms of reading, it's really important just to, um, well, A, keep as much as you can, keep the frame around reading that it's something that's fun you know, to really encourage kids to pick books that they like, that fuel their interests, that they can take home and read um, with their parents or other caregivers um, and to put less emphasis on this is for tests or this is for, you know, you have to be good at this or whatever. It's something that should be enjoyable and fun because kids that enjoy reading are more likely to practice it, to do it at home and, and do it for, for, a, for a long time. Because um, I hear that a lot from families in the clinic. They're like, you know, well, they have to get ready for their tests and they don't like it and they got homework and, and it's just, you know, Reading as much as as much as it can be, it should be fun. Um, as far as the types of books, I mean, I'm a big believer in traditional books just because they do they do encourage that focus and and um, they do help the child to sort of build their imagination muscles and their attention muscles and to sit down and slow down and just really focus on that book. Um, the thing about the digital books is and they are used a lot because you can get a lot of books on a tablet, for example, inexpensively, and that's certainly a major issue for a lot of families and, and, you know, it, as it should be. So if that's a thing, just making sure that the tablet or whatever device it is has as few bells and whistles as possible. If it's just a reader, you know, not that it's got other apps and email and other stuff at that age, because the more kids are encouraged to focus, the better. Um, so yeah, so I think those are some of the, some of the ones that I would encourage. Dr. Hutton, is there any, current research or developments that you're following in the field of reading science and, and brain development that you find particularly exciting or promising? Yeah. And, and, and I want, want to back up real quick and just say one more thing to Terry's point before. Um, the other thing I, I would encourage the school districts is to encourage a child to participate in the story. Like mm -hmm. the, the more you can encourage what's called dialogic reading um, and, you know, and, and we've done trainings with with parents, like bringing in groups of parents to community centers and libraries and other places, coaching them and how to, how do you read interactively with the child? And it's it's amazing. There's so much mythology out there that if the child asks questions during the story, it's rude or or um, you know that they should just you know it should be just this one way street. The more you can get a child involved, asking questions, trying to participate and read some of the words themselves, and it, it's the more they're interacting, the better. Um, anyway. Um, so yeah, so dialogic reading. Um, as far as developments in the field, um, I mean, I, I think just the issue that the elephant in the room is is certainly um, technology. You know, just how is that going to come in, and and how are we going to find a balance between traditional books and um, devices? And COVID sort of accelerated that just because so many kids were doing their homework at home on on laptops and and tablets. And, um, it's almost like that genie hasn't been put back in the bottle. Like we, <laughs> we sort of had rules about technology before COVID and then COVID happened and we kind of got rid of all of them. Now COVID's over, or at least we're through the main parts of the lockdown and we haven't rolled it back to, to, we're still having a hard time finding limits. So I think, um, really the, the, the big issues in the field have to do with, um, you know, just what age is appropriate to introduce these devices to kids um, and when they are introduced, you know, what what features should they have? And um, and it seems like as far as far as I've as I've seen, just the, the main area of, of benefit of them is, is more like um, FaceTime and just it, like, you know, to communicate with a grandparent or other caregiver that's far away. But as far as learning through these devices, I think that the it's. Um, the jury is definitely still out about whether or not that's really super useful for younger kids. Um, it, technology will certainly be a big part of their life going forward, but 
Um, but early, it's it's hard to say. And I think the final final one um, that's probably a huge issue is the idea that not all kids are the same as far as their relationships with technology. There's a um, there there are different susceptibilities to benefits and risks, um, and it's called differential susceptibility, where we're learning that. A lot of screen time research shows fairly small negative effects across the board with kids in a whole population, but that probably is mostly that some kids who are young might benefit from some technology, some may have a little bit of both, and some may really struggle. And it's important to really look at each child individually and say, is this a child who has a harder time um, setting limits, who may have more of an addictive temperament <laughs> is this a child that gets really anxious when they use too much any uh, their devices anyone and, with more than one yeah. child at home or a classroom teacher can can vouch for that <laughs> anecdotally that. <laughs> that, yeah and that, that they're different and that's hard because you want to treat kids the same yep. and you know you don't want to say well we're taking your tablet away but we're going to give the other child their tablet and how do we address that and my, my main way is just like keep them away as long as we can for everyone until the brains had more of a chance to develop. Um, we make kids wait till, till they're 16 to drive cars and 18 to vote and everything. And so why we have to get tablets into kids' hands so early, I think I, I would say until we know for sure that it's not harmful um, and it truly is helpful, it, we can delay as long as, as long as we can. That's good. So we asked this question to all of our guests um, before we let them go. So I have one question that I want to get from you. What are two things that educational leaders can do to accelerate reading achievement? I think uh, really just one would just be hyper focus on the enjoyment of reading, you know, just continuing to celebrate that reading is not something that's just for getting ready for tests and, and everything, but to, to really, um, how can we improve um, kids having access to books that they like? And this could be the topics, you know, whether it's cars and trucks or, um, or um, animals or whatever. It can also be making sure that there's more diversity represented in books where kids see themselves in the books or their families, you know, books that look like them and their experience. So I think, you know, really continuing to push the content um, uh, in, in a, the most joyful way possible. And then um, I think I think really just um, trying to get a better sense of of what the family resources are in terms of that reading environment at home. Um, like do like I mentioned with dialogic reading, like is there a way for the school to help coach parents in how to how to take the baton, sort of like a a relay race, and 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 read more interactively with their kids at home. And um, like so, we've done some trainings, you know, coaching families in dialogic reading, and then once they, the light bulb goes on, they're like, oh, this is this is fun reading. You know, this is great. You know, this is, um, and anyway, so, so I think, I think those are two great things. Um, and then, uh, uh, for older kids, I think keeping cell phones out of the building as much as possible mm -hmm. is something I would love to see. So, you know, just leave, leaving them in the, in the parking lot. So. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, thank you so much. Um, Dr. Hutton, if our li listeners want to learn more about your work, what are the best places to send them? So um, I let's see. I mean, all my my scientific papers are are in a thing called PubMed, which 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 contains like all the scientific papers in the world, but it's a little little boring. <laughs> um, so so I have a, a bio at the Cincinnati Children's website and one at uh, UT Southwestern's website that kind of shows a little bit about some of the research we've done. My children's books are at uh, bluemanatiepress.com, which is the the company that's published. Uh, my children's books. Um, and then I, there are email links in both these places if anyone wants to get in touch with me with some exciting stories about their their reading journey. Well, awesome. Thank you so much. This has um, just been a really interesting conversation. And I think that, you know, as educators, we have a lot of experiences that align with what you said. And you gave us some of the science and the words um, behind the things that we've seen and the things that we do to help kids learn to read. So thank you so much for being with us. We I feel so. just so honored to have had this time. So thank you. It's been my pleasure, uh, Terry and Christy. Hope you all have a lovely day. Thanks for joining us. If you found this conversation valuable, please subscribe and leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. We will see you next time on Science of Reading Leadership, Guiding Minds, Transforming Lives.